thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is the Department of Homeland Security Silicon Valley Innovation Program's Industry Day. Um, and uh, we are here to talk about one of our uh, newest funding opportunities. My name is M Melissa O. Oh, I'm the Managing Director for the SBIP program uh, within DHS Science and Technology. Uh, so we're really excited to have you all here and uh, there's gonna be an exciting uh, agenda for the next couple hours. Um, and we actually have folks attending via Twitter and Periscope, so if you have any questions, uh, please use hashtag ask SciTech SVIP uh, if you're attending through Twitter and Periscope. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. There's some coffee and water in the back. Bathrooms are that way, and Wi-Fi is right here. So uh, please enjoy. Uh, so for today, we are going to um, just run through an overview of the program. Um, and, uh, and then we're gonna have a use case of panelists uh, talking about um, the, the, the blockchain call that we put out. Uh, so we have uh, three of our DHS uh, operational agencies here to talk about their pain points and use cases. Um, and then we'll go into the technical uh, ask uh, problem set that we're, we're funding. Um, and then we're gonna uh, have our intellectual property attorney talk about what DHS SVIPs, what we're looking for when it comes to IP. Uh, as opposed to uh, what you may think. So demystify that a bit. And we're gonna have a Q and A, and, and if those are, uh, if folks are interested, we're going to talk about how you can apply um, and wrap up. We're also gonna have some optional office hours, so networking, talking uh, with the panelists, myself, uh, and the rest of the program if you guys are interested. Super. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, the Silicon Valley Innovation Program started about three years ago, um, literally three years ago. And uh, we have myself and Jennifer, uh, who's in the back. We're based out here on the West Coast in Silicon Valley. And we've got a team in DC as well, um, Doug Mon. Uh, so these are the faces to recognize in the room for when we have off office hours um, and to talk. Um, Anil John is my technical director. He'll also be moderating the panel later. And Ron McNeil is our transition director. Uh, he's uh, responsible for making sure that the technologies that we fund are, are made in, uh, make it into the hands of our operators and get used in the field. So I've got a, a great support team, Angela, Mike, and CJ, they're based in DC, uh, and, and not featured is Chi as well, uh, and Cheryl up here is, uh, is with our uh, general counsel team. So the program started about three years ago because we uh, in the government and the Department of Homeland Security felt that uh, it was difficult to harness the technologies coming out of the startup community. So we specifically set up this program to really engage uh, the uh, entrepreneurs and startups that are developing commercial technologies that would be beneficial to the Department of Homeland Security's use cases. Um, we felt that it was important for us to um, be able to get those innovative technologies into the hands of our operators and users uh, in a more relevant time frame than we've historically been able to do. Um, so we've developed uh, the program, we set up three lines of business, educate through industry days like this, basically have our operators come out here, talk to you all about what their pain points are, what some of their challenges are, um, talk about their use cases, so you can frame in your minds what technologies um, you're developing that may be able to be applicable um, to our use cases. Um, so that's through some of the events that we do, going into conferences, uh, speaking at different events. Um, and, uh, but secondly, we also fund. We, we provide up to 800,000 of non-dilutive funding to help companies adapt their product, um, not take them off their commercial roadmap, but just strictly um, adapt the product uh, so that it can be used by the Department of Homeland Security. And thirdly, we uh, provide for test opportunities. Part of the program is to pilot those technologies, get them in the hands of end users, uh, really iterate on that product, and um, provide that feedback to the companies as well as to the end users of how the technology can be fielded. So we feel that that's uh, the three lines of business, uh, business that will really um, help us succeed in getting these great technologies that you're developing into the hands of our uh, field. How we partner. So as I mentioned, we're actually leveraging the technologies that you entrepreneurs and startups are developing um, on the commercial side. We felt that uh, there's so much uh, innovation that's happening in that space. We want to be able to um, take the technology that you're working on and describe what our problem sets are so you can consider opening the aperture slightly and have a secondary customer, have a, have a, have a 
additional use cases, potentially additional lines of business you can um, have through the federal government. Um, so that's us leveraging uh, what you're de developing. If you look at it, um, consider dual use cases, um, dual use features and that sort of thing. Um, so we're looking at that intersection of both commercial and homeland security applications. Um, what we don't want is for startups to pivot. We don't want you to, to um, divert off your commercial roadmap. We, we want a commercial product in the end um, because that is much more sustainable for us and much more affordable for us as well. Um, we, and what, what's important is that we're not taking equity and we're not taking IP. So as I mentioned, it's non-dilutive funding. What we're paying for is essentially non-recurring engineering costs to do the product development. And uh, in terms of IP, Cheryl will get into it later, um, we're really only interested in um, technical data, technical reports, not any of your core IP. Uh, we want you to be successful as a company. We just want a commercial product that we can use in the future. So um, it's, it takes a lot longer for us to take an existing commercial product and, and tailor it to us, so why don't we get to you earlier? Um, and so we're actually interested in working with some of the more early stage startups, um, usually pre-series A, pre-series B, because um, that's really sort of our, our sweet spot in working with the company. Um, how we fund. Um, as you, if you heard about this um, industry day through our solicitation or topic call or LinkedIn, um, basically, we issue our topic calls, which describe the problem set and the use cases. Um, it goes into the technical interest and detail of what we're, of how we're thinking of the problem and how we think we may be able to use solutions in, in, in the operations. And so we, we release those topic calls. Um, they're open for roughly six to 12 months. Um, so basically, we are trying to get to entrepreneurs and startups when it makes sense for them to really apply to our program. Um, and uh, so that's why we leave it open um, with uh, periodic deadlines. So you'll see in the solicitation that we have various deadlines during the, during the open call. Um, so you'll wanna make sure to pay attention to those application deadlines, make sure you submit, um, and don't wait to the last minute because inevitably something will go wrong with your application. Um, essentially what we're asking for is a 10 page uh, application. Uh, we give you the form, uh, you can find it online and uh, it asks for basically, you know, what's your innovation? What are you, what's, uh, what's your commercial product that you're developing? Um, how can it be adapted for our use case? And what work would you perform? How much is that gonna cost? And ultimately each, um, each the first phase of application is up to $200,000 and anywhere between three to six months. You propose that. Um, you propose how, how that uh, work uh, project will look like to us um, based, on, based on the problem set and use case that, that you've read. What will happen is our review team, uh, which is made up of technical experts and operator experts, operational experts, uh, will review your application after the deadline. We'll get back to you whether or not we've invited you um, to, to come in to pitch us. Um, and that's all virtual. So we'll do a 15 minute pitch if we think um, the application's a good fit. And um, after the 15 minute pitch, we'll do 15 minutes of Q&A. And then we'll ask you to drop off as, as we deliberate and make decision um, and we and I'll get back to you within 24 hours of whether or not it's a fund or no fund. Um, and on average, um, we from the decision to the award has been on average about 45 days to getting that award. Um, what's up here is showing that we're um, funding up to 800,000, so that's over four tranches, four phases. Each phase is progressively um, advancing the product. So for the first phase is um, let's the proof of concept. We, what we want to see is we've got a commercial product. We think it can be applicable to DHS, let's do a proof of concept, that's, first, that's the first phase. <coughs> if it seems that, that that's a good fit, then we'll uh, invite to the next phase, which is prototyping, and then follow, following that, piloting, and then further, further from that, uh, limited deployment. So um, as you progress through the phases, um, you'll, we'll, we'll get to have a very collaborative uh, relationship with, between the technical side, the entrepreneur, and the uh, operator and end user. So the goal is um, to get the products to be usable by our, our end users um, and, um, and commercialized so that, the, so, so that DHS can purchase it downstream. So why, why work with us? Um, I think that you all are here because of you're interested in working with DHS um, or at least wanna hear more about what we're looking for. And uh, um, ultimately, as I mentioned, uh, the funding that we provide is equity free. We're not, um, we're not looking for uh, any kind of investment. 
um, we're really uh, wanting to get a solution uh, to our problem, or a customer looking for a solution. Um, basically, the network that we that we give you is um, pretty significant. We have a really wide network within a Homeland Security Enterprise, whether that's um, within DHS, our operators within DHS, as well as the first responder community, and even broader to, broader to that into, into the international community. So um, as you are developing your products, as you're working with us, um, we share what you guys are working on with our partners um, as you are interested in, um, and hopefully that gets, uh, gets the word out further of, uh, for the company. Um, as far as mentorship goes, we have a broad range of uh, companies that we funded already, as well as a technical team and operator team that really mentors the company um, and helps them understand the program a bit better um, and, our, and our problem sets better. Um, and as far as market validation goes, you know, we're a customer looking for a solution and um, the, the uh, feedback we've received from the startups we've already funded has shown that um, that has been um, a significant, that has been significant for them too. Um, and we're, we're proud to have startups in our portfolio we do press releases, we announce um, uh, the companies that we work with, we do showcase events um, where I invite the companies to present and really get the word out, talk to some of the other um, government uh, agencies that exist in DC. We really try to uh, amplify your reach. Um, and uh, and uh, a good number of companies have told us that the project that, that we have funded for them have helped them uh, uh, raise additional capital um, beyond um, their existing investment. So, that's been uh, good news for us too. Um, we have, uh, since uh, in the three years that we've been in operation, um, we have um, a pretty broad range of um, topics that we have funded across our portfolio, from IoT security to cybersecurity to aviation security. Um, that one, that topic is actually still open. Um, so uh, if you're interested, go to our website and take a look. Um, that's object recognition, uh, ad adaptive algorithms for object recognition. Um, we've also done work in canine wearables um, and right now in blockchain. So this is our newest uh, for, uh, newest uh, vertical, um, so we're excited to, to get into that. Um, so we have funded 14 topics to date, over 370 applications uh, and 59 phase one pitches. We have funded 36 companies and uh, um, what's exciting is that of, the, um, of, of all those companies, we've already had four successful transitions. Um, that's really exciting. We've got companies telling us that um, they're already getting licensing deals from the, the customers they're working with. Um, they are getting purchase, uh, purchase orders from the operational components. Um, so this is, this is good news. Um, and uh, that's what we want to hear from a science and technology organization. We want to hear that the companies that we're funding and working with are working very closely with the uh, end users and getting uh, getting uh, additional deals um, downstream. Um, so, if you want to learn more about additional uh, calls in the future, feel free to um, join our mailing list if you're not already on it. This is the email address. Just send us a note. I don't spam you guys. I just send notes uh, talking about sort of uh, what our new funding opportunities are, uh, any kind of major events that we're having, industry days, that sort of thing. So uh, if, you gotta, if you wanna know more about what DHS is doing, what FDIC is doing, feel free to, feel free to uh, join the mailing list. <coughs> um, so as I mentioned, um, part, of the pro part of our program is, a big part of our program is actually bringing the operators to you guys, to the entrepreneurs to understand um, what the pain points are. And so uh, as part of this newest call on blockchain, we, um, we brought out uh, three of our operators that are um, where the use cases have been described in the call. So if you haven't taken a look at it, it's important you take a look at that before you decide to apply. Um, but I really wanted uh, Anil to get up here and uh, um, and introduce his panel and uh, talk about those pain points. So you guys have a better understanding of what we're looking for and how um, how uh, you can help us. is hot. <laughs> so if I break this chair and it gets on Facebook, I get royalties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so welcome to everybody. Uh, I 
only read this um, out loud. My name is Anil John, the three gentlemen sitting next to you, uh, they are not in order, so let me actually um, uh, introduce each of you to, each of them to you. Um, <laughs> yes, Ted, Ted is definitely in order. <laughs> so, uh, um, Vinny Anunciado is with our trade side of Customs and Border Protection. He leads the innovation organizations within there. He's actually been very involved in a lot of our international trade blockchain efforts uh, that have resulted in significant lessons learned that are now being incorporated into this particular call as well. So we'll talk about that. Uh, Ted Sobel is with the Requirements and Capability Analysis Section Group Division. I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but within <laughs> our Transportation Security Administration. Um, Ted has an interesting background in that prior to his detail to TSA, he was very involved in our Screening Coordination Office uh, defining a lot of the requirements for credentialing um, for things like real ID and a variety of other processes. So he brings not just the TSA side of the house, but also a significant amount of background in the security aspects of credentials that are issued. And last but not least is Jared Goodwin uh, from our Office of Intake and Document Production. Him and his people, and there is a set of people here in the audience, which I'm sure that you all meet, own the process for the issuance of everything from um, citizenship um, uh, documentation, green cards, uh, entitlements for working in the US and a variety of others. So really happy to have all three gentlemen up here. And what I wanted to do right now is instead of, um, just to set the stage here, understand that the Department of Homeland Security is a very large organization. It is composed of a variety of different operational entities and we just met representatives from three of them. But each of them sort of have different missions. So what you're hearing, going to be hearing is the perspective of that operational component in how this technology could apply to their needs. Um, yeah, I'm not going to spend any more time on it, but what I want to do next is sort of go through each of the use cases and have the operational component who sort of owns that talk to what their pain points are, and uh, I just took a picture of everybody so I have you all in case I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, USCIS, and Jared is basically going to talk about what their pain points are in this particular process, and what they hope to get out of this going forward as well. And gentlemen, we're going to give each of you about a seven to ten minute piece of time. All right, thank you, Bill. Thanks. Thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate this. Um, I'm very excited about this um, for a number of reasons. Um, one is it's free for me right now, since <laughs> S&P is funding it, so I'm very happy that I don't have to go ask for more money. But more importantly is uh, uh, my office within USCIS, I think is pretty unique in the sense that we are very innovative, we're, we're very forward thinking, um, we don't take no a lot from the traditional bureaucratic system that we find ourselves in, um, particularly when we're talking IT, um, you know, the enterprise-wide, CIOs have a very tough job. The last thing they need is some you know, lowly GS-15 you know, manager coming by and saying, hey, I want to try this really cool project, when they're worrying about keeping email servers up and national systems up. So the fact that we can partner with S&P and, and, and you folks on something like this is, is, is really a phenomenal opportunity for, for us and my program. So specifically about this use case, um, as Anil said, my program issues about four million physical credentials a year. Primarily, it's the uh, permanent resident card, or the green card, and the employment authorization document. Those are standard driver's license looking cards. Some of you may have them or, or received them in the past. Um, but we spend a lot of time and effort on not just issuing those, but ensuring that the cards are as, as highly resistant to counterfeiting and fraud as possible, while at the same time not spending an inordinate amount of money creating some you know, multi-million dollar cards. So what I did about two years ago, um, we introduced what we called our next generation green cards. Uh, we went through an 18 month process of updating those features and security, uh, went to a couple conferences, 
And one of the key talking points at those conferences, talking with folks from, um, from industry that deal in that world, is when you're responding to our RFP, uh, it's gotta be practical. What you propose has to be interoperable with our systems. And we're talking systems that have been around since the 80s um, to systems that are just being developed today. So somehow what you develop and propose needs to fit within our construct so me as an operator um, can issue these and get them out the door. Um, and that's going to transition into this topic in the sense that what you propose um, to us needs to kind of fit with what we already have. Um, we can't build a new data center. We can't transition to our new operating systems. Um, it's got to fit within the construct of, of what we have today. And I'm pretty encouraged by some of the reading I've done on blockchain and, and some of the other applications that are out there, that this, this is a pretty adaptable and integratable um, solution and concept. Um, so, so again, I'm very excited about it. And, and basically what we're trying to do is put a green card on a smartphone. Um, there's, there's several states out there, Delaware, Maryland, I think it's Montana, one of those the northern states, is, is doing uh, mobile driver's licenses. And it's, a, it's not a, a one or the other. They're still gonna get issued a physical credential, and, but this, this mobile credential would complement it. Um, there's some great value in that for me as a program manager. Um, if people lose their physical credential or they need to change their physical credential, we can quickly push a change, whether it's a last name, someone gets married, you know, you know, we mess up an issue along, somehow mess, you mess up your date of birth and you need a new credential, but you have to travel in two weeks. If we can push that to your smartphone and it's verifiable, it can be read by someone like TSA um, as you're leaving the country or CBP as you're re-entering the country, um, that's gonna be a great efficiency, not just for us as a program, but our customer base um, as well um, that actually get these things. So we're really looking to, to come into the 21st century you know, it's inevitable. Everything's going to our smartphones. And, and, and I really want our program to be at the forefront of identity documents that can support travel, employment, and other types of verification in a mobile virtual environment that is secure, um, uh, resistant to fraud, and counterfeiting. And so that's my use case. So I'll just highlight, uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions after the technical session, so we're going to be, uh, so that you can get both the technical pieces as well as the, the business side questions answered all at once. But I wanted to highlight a couple of points uh, before we transition to Ted, um, in that you are in the rare position where you actually have issuers of credentials and validators and verifiers of credentials at the same table. You also are in the rare position where the we're not interested in changing the backend processes for, for how uh, these type of credentials are issued. So conceptually thinking about, think about it from the perspective, there is a process for whereby we vet the, uh, the qualifications of that person to ensure that they're eligible for that credential. At the end of the process, currently, there is some sort of a button push somewhere that results in something being sent to a printer right now. The current security of what is printed is basically uh, based on the cardstock and the holograms that are applied to it. We are concerned about that. So what we want is when we push that button, we want the ability to not just issue the paper, because we're not going to get away from that anytime soon, but also have the ability to simultaneously issue a digital credential that is equivalent or greater security in what they are doing, right? So that is the piece, and the key for the startups that are working with us is that these entities like the screening coordination office, the real ID office within, within, uh, within um, DHS, USCIS, these are the folks who are basically defining the security of these incredibly important documents. If you are able to get through the gates in producing a solution that meets their need, you now have an opportunity to basically use that same technology in your private efforts that you will not get from anyone else in the world. So on that note, let me uh, uh, transition over to the wonderful people
that I'm sure that you encountered on the way here um, <laughs> if you flew in uh, our TSA folks. Over to you, Ted. And your plane landed all right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very much a wonderful people. So we're driven by really two sets of numbers. First number is two million. That's how many people go through our checkpoint each day. That's not how many flights there are. There's even more of that. But two million people go in, you know, go through a TSA, TSA checkpoint, either on a direct flight or a personal flight. The second number is 4%. 4% is annual growth in that two million number. Now, there's another number out there, which is our, our TSA screeners. That ain't going to change. With that two million passengers, that changes. And how many people here enjoy waiting in queues? <laughs> Yet to have anyone say yes to that. Um, so our challenge as an organization is, how do we manage this growth year in, year out? Not an even growth either. You'll have peaks and valleys depending on the season. How do we manage getting those travelers through the checkpoint in a way that doesn't hurt commerce, that keeps everybody that you know, meets expectations of the travelers, and at the same time meets our, our fundamental mission of keeping a flight secure. The only way to do that is through innovation. I think, I'll tell you, I think very highly of people. Um, sorry if that's a bad thing to say in Silicon Valley. But for me, we got some great screeners who are really well trained. I want them to focus on the things that only people can do. I want machines to be able to focus on things that machines can do well. That's what this is all about for us. So let's take it through a TSA checkpoint. What happens? You go up, uh, a TSA screener has to get your ID, look at it, decide is this on our list of about 25 different types of documents <laughs> that, they, that we accept. So is it an acceptable form of ID? Are there any signs of tampering or fraud? Does the name match the name on the boarding pass? Does the picture on the card match the person in front of me? Make the screening decision. Tell that person which direction they need to go. You got two seconds to do that. Maximum <laughs> two seconds to do all those stages. And on top of all that, remember I said there's things that only people can do? Instinct. That is really one of the greatest things that a TSA screener brings to this process, is their instinct that they're seeing travelers every day, all day, to be able to spot what might be different. And that's the difference between catching a, a threat and missing a threat. I would rather a bigger chunk of that two seconds be spent looking for what's out of the ordinary than try to look at what's ordinary. In other words, we really have two types of technology. We're, we're dealing with a fundamental problem of finding a needle in a haystack. We have two different types of technologies to do that. One focuses on, on the needle. The other focuses on making that haystack smaller. So we really see mobile driver's licenses as a way to make that haystack smaller because it's automating a lot of these functions that in that two seconds that screen has to do. Um, so that's sort, of, that's sort of the bottom line of one of our case scenarios. You know, there's a lot of technologies coming to the checkpoints. I think the checkpoints you see five, six years down the road, probably sooner than that, uh, will uh, be very different than what you see today because we're investing in technology to read cards. We're investing in technology um, for where it works on privacy and civil rights, civil liberties basis to do facial recognition um, to speed these processes along. So a digital driver's license or mobile ID is something that we want to be able to plug in to these these systems and we want to make sure we're making our decisions today in a way that does not uh, lock us in to one particular solution uh, tomorrow. We need to be ready for how the market goes because as we said you know, we want to be consumers we don't want to be uh, uh, we don't want to be standard users in this area. We want to be consumers. It's good for us our need case probably isn't that different for everyone else. So that's sort of one use case set. The other use case that, that we talked about is uh, on uh, the particular issue of tribal IDs. And although we use that as a use case, it's actually a broader issue for us. So, so before you do that, um, it is going to be pretty straightforward 
for people to understand why tribal ID validation is important to USA. But you may not be as familiar what USCIS equities in this particular is. So I wanted to uh, turn it over to Jared just to explain that piece of it. So, so the, the Immigration Nationality Act is, is very complex. Um, it's, it's big. I mean, there's, there's certain sections and, and nuances within it that apply to certain um, populations. And one of those is, is Native Americans and tribal um, uh, individuals. And there's a specific section in the INA, Section 289, that um, authorizes or, re or regulates our agency to provide um, documentation to Native Americans and, and tribal entities for identity. Um, and one of the, the, the recurring themes is, is, is how does that support their travel um, specifically across the northern border is, a, is a, the more current use case that we're dealing with within the agency is a, a group of individuals that are tribal, they're sovereign, um, that, don't, that, that live and work on opposite sides of the Canadian border, which historically does not, did not exist. Um, so how do, we, how do we issue that to them um, without having to create a physical document uh, for a relatively small population of people? And one of the ways we could do that is to issue them a mobile ID. Thank you. I'll simply note that he met, touched upon the fact that this is of obviously of relevance to our northern um, countrymen as well. Having spoken to the Canadian folks on this, I know that this particular use case and this need is just as relevant and as important. And immediately I think the startups here can get the idea that their technology is not just usable within the US context, but widely and broadly useful. And using that, from from the TSS perspective, how is this different than some of the, the standard pieces that we you, you do the validation for? Right. So remember I said we have a list of about 25, 26 different types of ID. That you know, doesn't sound too hard, except take one form of ID, it is a passport. So generally there's about 10 different versions of passports you know, for the United States alone. You get all the international as well. For then you have driver's license, by far more most common one. There you have 56 jurisdictions, because we also have territories, as well as states in the District of Columbia. We have um, uh, uh, different types of IDs, driver's licenses from each state. Are you under 18, are you over 18, under 21, over 21? Uh, are you a real ID compliant, or are you not real ID compliant? Lots and lots of different versions of this. Um, so those are two fairly simple ones. So, you might be talking about around 250, 300 types of driver's license when you count it. Now let's talk about, answer the question about tribes. You're talking about roughly about 5,000 different types of tribal IDs that we're working on. Uh, it's hard enough to get screeners to be able to recognize the different types of driver's licenses. Being able to spot and understand uh, you know, how the different, you know, be able to identify signs of fraud in a Chippewa, uh, ID uh, versus uh, 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 Sioux ID, thank you. Uh, and that's, that's asking a lot. What we'd much rather have is um, an ability to understand, you know, A, we have got the establishing that's recognizing IDs, but we want to know what went into the ID to make the decision. So the ID, whether it's a, a physical token, whether it's an electronic token, is only a way to pass a message along. That message is, you know, here, this is a person's identity that some, some group, some entity has decided that that person holding it is the owner of that identity. Uh, what we don't know is how that entity made that decision. <laughs> so for driver's license, it's real ID, it's an absolution. It, we have common standards across states. Uh, I see a star on a driver's license. I know what went into establishing that identity. When I see a tribal ID, I have no idea what goes into establishing that identity. It could be extremely fantastic if there are many tribal identities that are great documents out there. There are others that are not so great. Um, a screener's not gonna be able to know that from about 5,000 different samples that they might encounter. And they might encounter you know, only two or three of them in the course of their career. And they have to still make the same decision that they had to make with the driver's license, where they have familiarity, where they have information. 
So for us, the, that, that second use case with tribal IDs, I think a really good example of what would be useful for us is in a way, in an automated way, that when, we're, when we have our systems looking at that ID, whether physical, whether it's digital, that we understand and there's a record of what kind of proof they went in to establish that that ID. Um, and that way, we could just have a lot more confidence because at the end of the day, what this all boils down to is a decision made by an individual at the travel document check function, at the TSA checkpoint, of do we, what kind of risk are we incurring, incurring by approaching the um, The more that we can do to get information, get an informed decision for that travel document check function, uh, that's a huge win for us, both on a security level and then operationally, it allows us to help meet that four, uh, that's probably soon to be 5% growth in uh, traffic. So I want to provide a bit of nuance to what Ted said. One is that, yep, the, the processes for issuing those credentials currently are very disparate. Uh, we are not, in this project, focused on that. Right? What we are in this project is focused on is assuming that there is a common set of APIs that are provided to the issuer, how do they issue an electronic attestation of tribal affiliation, utility, and things of that nature. That is the piece that we are focused on. So I want to make sure that you sort of understand because the former actually has significant amount of policy and legal implications as you might imagine which we are not going to tackle as part of this. What we are focused on is the technical aspects of ensuring that the credential that is issued is indeed as good or better than the current set of credentials that are out there and the protections that are applied to it is as good. I hate saying as good because as good is not really all that good, but it, it, <laughs> it's something that is uh, really, really um, uh, mitigating for the encounter. We want to know the we want to know the message, not the standards. So on that note, I am going to turn it over to my friend Vinny over here. Uh, we are switching over from the identity documents and things of that nature to something that is in his wheelhouse, which is he is with the Office of Trade. Um, I keep saying that in general, when people talk about customs and border protection, they tend to focus on the sexy parts of it, which is the border protection. But it's important to understand that the custom side of it has been around, has been funding the, U funded the US government until the 1920s, and has been around as long as America has been around. So you are talking to a representative from an organization that has been around for a long while, has a lot of existing processes in place, and is significantly leaning forward in seeing how innovative technologies can actually improve that effort. So, and the first use case that we had is around the identity of organizations, which came out of some of the current work and proof of concept that he's done on the blockchain side regarding NAFTA CAFTA uh, proof of concept for them. Over to you. I think you just told me I'm not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> and old. And old. I can't win. I've been working with Emil for over, well over a year, so we uh, uh, make fun of each other all the time, not through time. But uh, it's great to be here with you all. Um, I want to let you know that some of the identity uh, management that we're talking about has come out from the fact that uh, I am now on the circuit speaking on, on blockchain events all over the country and internationally. A lot to do with uh, what Emil is helping to accomplish in, in our agency. And um, when we first started talking about identities, uh, especially at the uh, corporate level, right, identifying businesses that are legitimate, I said, what's so great about blockchain? Right. You put it up on, on the blockchain, and now all of a sudden everybody thinks it's secure. <laughs> I said, do I really know who is coming onto my blockchain? Right. So that discussion has been happening. In fact, a lot of the, the mystery uh, that we've been going around talking about with this, this newly disruptive technology, which we think is really going to hit home over the next three to five years, um, is just that. How do I make it so that it's not just pushed a step back and put onto the operator to go in and figure out uh, whether or not you have a legitimate company. Because somebody could stand up a corporation, right, potentially, import, and then at a certain point they get caught, take it down, stand up another one, 
right? All of these things are obvious, right? But how do I get to the point where if I have a, a credential in there, it gives me some information. How long have you been transacting with somebody, all right? Do you have proof that you've been around? Have you imported before? All those types of things, even though some of that you probably draw out of my system. Um, the other thing that's happening uh, with blockchain is in its truest and most natural form. I'm not talking for all of you purists who are into public blockchains, okay? Is we're gonna set up private blockchains, that's for sure, in the supply chain of the world. But it gets to a certain point where, um, oh my gosh, I just lost my thought. What did you say? Blockchains are natural environments. I'm sorry, say that again. Blockchains are natural environments. Oh, yeah, environment. thank you. All right. I would have some more of a That's the other thing. Um, gosh. Anyway, the truest sense of the word, what blockchain should be used for, is going out over the internet to retrieve data that we haven't gotten before. Right? If I'm just creating an internal system, do I need blockchain? No. But if I'm going out and I'm getting information from entities, that I've never been able to capture before, now it becomes the safest way, that at least that I know how, that we can reach out and get that data. And that's why those credentials are becoming very, very important. All right, we are trying to reach out, and we're trying, um, we have a, a university study also going on with another area of DHS, where we're looking at what is blockchain gonna look like 10 years from now, and how is the government gonna interact with it. And if it's happening right, blockchain should become a team sport, right? Because everybody at the key points, key decision points that's involved in your supply chain should be giving you data. I need to know who those, those people are and who those organizations are. And the irony probably is that all of this that we're talking about is at some point going to get tied together, right? Because you have businesses, entities, uh, people that are all tied into this. And at some point it's all going to come together. I don't know when that's going to be. So within that particular context, you will notice that if you look at this use case, what is obviously of relevance to us is that um, if you have a, it is going to be a reality that there are going to be multiple supply chain consortiums. They may choose to use different blockchain technologies. If you want to scale it, you need to have some way of automating the, automating the discovery of the identity of the organization who is delegated to perform actions on behalf of that organization. That is sort of the use case around it. And um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna turn it back over to, there will be time for questions. Uh, so Vinny actually is not stopping with the uh, uh, identity of organizations. He has definitely has two more use cases here as well. The first of them being the cross-border oil import tracking. Um, also, I want to give you this, it, you know, you just hit a, a, a note that I got to make sure I finish. As far as scalability, as far as size, I mean, proof of concept is not going to be that big, but I want you to understand that the economy, that cargo, because um, I'm on the cargo side, but the effect on the economy is, is, is tremendous. Long Beach alone, Long Beach Seaport, is considered the fifth largest economy in the world. We are probably the largest transactional system in the world, at least last that I checked, we were some ridiculous amount of transactions, okay? We get uh, 20 million to 30 million entries. Each of those have up to 999 lines of information. And each one of those with a partner government agency can have up to 99,999 lines of 80 character pieces of code, okay? It's huge. All right, what am I doing? Pipeline. Pipeline. So, pipeline. Pipeline um, actually is, uh, uh, we are in the next stage of this. We've already um, outlined some operational flows. We are um, putting together requirements and we're starting to reach out to the big oil industries, Shell, Exxon. I know a couple of you had organizations that were at my uh, pipeline meeting last, uh, about two weeks ago. And um, what this use case, uh, it's very interesting because right now everything is put on a piece of paper. So we have what's called, I hate to say this, but it's like a spigot, okay? Somebody turns something and the oil goes into the truck. We need to know what's in there. Now, if you're gonna make a NAFTA claim coming into the US that's free of duty, you probably heard a lot about that in the news, you need to make sure that it's not commingled with all sorts of oil, other oils that are coming from other countries. And what we want to start capturing is the track and trace part of this. How do we know 
what the uh, makeup is, and it's recorded on paper right now, of that oil that's being imported into the US. And what may be the trickier part of this is how do we track, as it's changing hands, believe it or not, over the stock exchange, not that I want to track the stock exchange because I don't need to know what high and lows are, but I need to know the beginning stage to the end stage, when that end state comes in, the last person that purchases it brings it into the country so that we can set that uh, in motion. Now, I'm just talking about unrefined oil, but this hits us in a whole bunch of different areas. Um, obviously, anything where the commodity is moving and the uh, conveyance is not. So natural gas might be another area at some point that we expand out to uh, with this proof of concept. Very, very important for our duties. Um, and that was what So in general, it is important to keep in mind that none of these technologies is solved by the magic wand of just blockchain, right? It, it is a combination of technologies. But what does blockchain or BLD bring to the table in solving this problem? And last use case is the origin of raw materials. Wow, I love this one. Um, you love all of them. I love all of them. Well, I love this one because uh, we're not sure of the size of what this could be. There's a, there's a number of different areas. Um, but the concept for U.S. customs, one of the most important things that we know, need to know is origin data. Where is the um, product coming from? Okay, could be the, uh, the manufacturer. It could be the supplier of the raw materials. In this case, that's what we're talking about. Uh, precious metals, how is, uh, what is the makeup of the precious metals? Where is it actually coming from? Think about timber. Um, is there a legal forest thing coming on board? Uh, and then diamonds, uh, just because I like diamonds. No. Um, but diamonds, um, how do we track them without having to engrave something uh, into the diamond to ruin its value? Those types of things are very important. There are some use cases going on out there. Um, I think some of them are more to make a lot of them are just to get uh, press involved, um, to bring awareness, but we need some legitimate tracking. Uh, it is a little tricky because at one point, like if you think about timber, um, they have to be stamping something onto the timber at that point. You, get, you start thinking about how do, how do you know that it came from that actual logging area, but I think it will help us control a lot of um, what, what's out there. And when you start talking about, uh, Ted stole my line of the needle in the haystack. Um, but when you start thinking about footprints, right, when you have a person that's targeting shipments and, um, you know, it's over all these 22 million in entries, think about all that data I just told you about, can you direct them to a much smaller um, footprint? And if you can, what that does is it, it does the dual side of what customs handles, right? Facilitating the shipments through so that we can keep our economy strong, right, versus the um, stopping all the terrorist plots and all that drugs and all that other stuff that we have on the enforcement side. Um, the thing that you'll find if you really study this is that ultimately it's all tied together. If you're finding illegal activity, that illegal activity is funding something else, right? So it's all tied together. It's a very, very important issue. Thank you. Um, so for right now, um, you heard from <coughs> three different parts of DHS that have in some ways both similar and different uh, use cases. These three gentlemen are just going to step off the stage right now, but they'll be back for a Q&A with me once I've sort of gone over the technical aspects of it. And they will definitely be here for during our uh, office hour as well. So if, if there are shy people in the room, uh, you know, please uh, come and ask them questions directly as well. So on that note, gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, you'll be back. <laughs>
we've done a token sale. We know things. <laughs> it's not going to work for us, right? So we have a set of set of needs. We have a set of lessons learned, and as Jared mentioned very capably, we have we have legacy infrastructure. It is important for you to be able to integrate with us in a manner that does not um, uh, support any type of locking. We, from the government perspective, we are interested in a competitive, diverse ecosystem of solutions that we can draw upon. And that is part of the, the reasoning for this call here. So, I'll touch on some of the lessons learned that we learned because you will see the lessons learned baked into what we are asking of the startup companies in this call. We are finding more and more that basically there isn't much thought given to architecture and integration when you are dealing with uh, integrating blockchain with existing systems and technology processes. Uh, how do you make decisions on what is kept on chain versus off chain? How do you provide an interoperable way of pointing from on chain to off chain? We find that uh, there is a significant um, enthusiasm around building a platform, and one of the ways that companies are trying to lock you into the platform is by having a proprietary data format that they use within their particular implementation for their ledger. That is not a path to success for, for us. Uh, I'll just use the use case of uh, Vinny and Office of Trade. If Office of Trade is in the business of ensuring that all cargo coming into the US um, is something that they're evaluating on a risk-based basis. Now, if there are multiple uh, trading consortiums each choosing a different blockchain environment, in order for CDP and Office of Trade to have visibility into that blockchain environment, it would require us to run a node of that individual blockchain. That becomes rapidly an N-squared problem that is not sustainable for us. So interoperability that you heard from all three of them becomes critically important in ensuring that there is choice in the marketplace, there is, interoperability does not mean everybody chooses one vendor's plot, uh, technology and implements it, trust me. <laughs> um, as somebody who spent significant amount of time in the identity management arena, distributed key management, has been, is, and more than likely will continue to be a hard problem. Blockchain vendors seem to be hand-waving rapidly on that problem. So we have we've sort of scoped a, a little bit of that challenge within our particular context here as well. And last but not least, what we learned very, very clearly is thou shalt never put private data, thou shalt never put uh, sensitive data ever on the chain, full stop. The combination of using encryption, which sooner or later will become broken because of Moore's law or some sort of an implementation choice that somebody has made, and a long-lived ledger is a frightening combination. That is not something that we want in any way, shape, or form, right? So how do you architect the solution such that you have pointers from on-chain to off-chain and not use encryption to hide the data or store the data, because sooner or later, that data will become public. So, we've spent, because of these choices, because of these reasoning, because of our needs in this particular space, we have either funded, championed, or are backing a set of specifications in the worldwide standards organization. Specifications are important, they are not standards. They are somebody's vision of what a standard needs to be that are in turn stand, turned over to a public standards organization and the sauce and making happens there where everybody can weigh in and at the end of it, you get a standard that everybody can sort of live with. Decentralized identifiers are something that we funded from its inception. Verifiable credentials are something that we are definitely backing, that was definitely proven and used in our NAFTA capital proof of concept to ensure interoperability between independent nodes from different vendors at the common data level. Last but not least, that's a long four on the 10, the distributed key management piece of it. These are things that we've learned are important to our organization 
and my sense in talking to counterparts of size, similar to us within the private sector and internationally, is that this is important to any large organization that needs to talk to a diverse audience. So, I'll give you one data point on how important this is. Based on our proof of concept, our work that we've done, what you see here is a letter of, uh, from our Customs and Border Protection uh, senior leadership. I'll cut to the chase. The largest customs organization on the face of the planet put a stake in concrete, not in sand, that basically said, if you want to interoperate with us using any type of blockchain technology, you will use it using these specifications that we are championing, full stop. So these are the lessons learned that we are taking forward into what we want to do. So section 2.1, I'm gonna hit a lot of the, each of the sections on things that I think you need to pay attention to. Um, and the language that we are using in there, just to make sure that everybody is clear on what is quote unquote required versus optional, whatever, you know, everybody has, can come up with interpretations, we are going to sort of make sure that we are very clear in what we are asking and what you're able to tell us in return. We're using the language that from ISO to define what is a requirement using the language of shall and shall not, and recommendation should and should not. If you are in the technology arena, if you're in the standards arena, this language should be very familiar to you. We're going to be using that. So scope of work here, conceptually speaking, right? So there is a set of issuers. There is some sort of a holder of a credential, an attestation, and there is some sort of a verifier at the other end, and there is some sort of a blockchain distributed ledger infrastructure out there. What we are concerned about, you know, so, so we, from the government, from DHS, from each of these operational components, we do not expect to own all of these. But we, from Jared's perspective, is an issuer. From Ted's perspective on TSA, they're a verifier, right? So, but this technology is basically, is not owned by any one entity. We do not control it but there is an ecosystem of participants that are there. What is important for us is to make sure that if you are an issuer, there are some standard set of APIs that they use in order to interact with this infrastructure. And again, on the other side, if you're a verifier of these attestations, there's a standard set of APIs that are being used in order to validate that document and verify that it actually belongs to somebody. So, three technical topic areas that are there. Um, I want to highlight one piece of it. People often sort of skim over it, but typically within government uh, pieces of it, every single word actually means something. What we're saying is that we believe that at a minimum, um, in, in an ideal situation, you require uh, you to solve both the, uh, the issuer and the verifier interfaces as well as some sort of a, the wallet piece in the middle. We've actually separated that, those two pieces into the issuance of verification of certificates in technical topic area one, and sort of the key management piece of it in technical topic area two. And I'll talk about three, which is, uh, which, which, is, which, is which is uniquely government, but also maybe interesting to larger entities out there. What I want to highlight here is that you as a company can basically tell us, I want to apply my solution only to one of those topic areas, and that is perfectly fine. You don't have to meet all three of them. We want, again, uh, innovative technologies that you are bringing to the table, and you can apply to just one top technical topic area. I would argue that in general, you may want to, if you want a complete solution, you probably will try to bring pieces to both the one and two and potentially three as well. But that is your choice. So technical topic area one, um, the piece that is not blurred out, right? Conceptually, 
I'm not saying that this is going to be down at the, the technical implementation level, but a conceptual model of these interactions between these participants require you that an issuer will issue some sort of a credential to a holder. That issuance process has to happen over some sort of a standardized API. When they are doing that, they also have to basically make sure that the proof of that issuance is also recorded on some sort of a DLT. You are absolutely not putting private data or sensitive data on the chain. The intent is to make sure that you use the blockchain environment as a way to ensure the validation of private or sensitive data without actually putting the private or sensitive data on the chain. If you are putting private data on the chain, please don't. <laughs> and we will, that may not be a path to success for you, right? Those, that, I'll be blunt in saying that basically, that is, um, that is not a good thing, and we are not going to be supporting a type of solution that requires you to uh, put private or sensitive data directly on the chain, even if it is encrypted. The other piece of it is, understand that on the right-hand side, we find a whole lot of blockchain companies trying to sort of reinvent the wheel when it comes to identity verification. Um, the verification of whether you are actually the holder of the credential itself is a standard ID verification problem. Strong authentication technologies are a commoditized standard. Thou shall use things like FIDO, OpenID Connect as a way of doing that. You will not come up and roll your own magic proof of possession stuff there. You will leverage existing open standards that are baked into every single product out there that has a tag name of Identity X product, right? So you will use that. Technology topic area two. This is where um, I'll simply note that I was a bit ambitious earlier outside of this project in trying to solve the distributed key management problem. And um, I'm not sure if I got to where we wanted to. So we, we, we sort of decided to scope the problems based on their needs. So what you're trying to solve here is that a blockchain environment, a DLT environment requires multiple parties to come together. We have not seen key management wallet solutions that are focused on the enterprise use case from a manageability, issuance, rekeying, reissuance processes. We are definitely interested in solving it within the context of an enterprise. How do you do that at that scale? Not the, the global you know, one ring to bind them all because we don't actually believe in the one ring to bind them all. So this is basically solving that key management wallet piece of it within the context of multiple parties in some sort of a consortium or a multiple blockchain and multiple entities in a blockchain environment. How do you solve that? That is what the technology, technical topic area two is all about, which is why I said that basically, typically, if you want an end-to-end -end solution, you gotta have both TTA one and TTA two. I'm hoping that you will come to the table with both, but we are okay with you coming to the table with one, but with a clear idea of how to basically address the other piece as well. The last piece of it is basically something that is um, a byproduct of what is happening within the context of the US government. Um, all of the, the government folks out here, whatever agency that you are in, whether you are a contract support person, are, is, are issued through a very rigorous identity proofing process, a smart card. Um, and of course, uh, if you're in the DOD, they call it a common asset card because DOD is DOD. <laughs> uh, but ultimately the standards and the specifications are very identical. But the, what we also discovered is that in the move to mobile, Smart cards don't exactly work with mobile devices. So we've now, uh, going down the path of what we call derived credentials. It is leveraging the existing issuance of a smart card to create, derive a credential, basically an x final certificate in a specific format that can be stored, for example, in a mobile phone, right? That is a derived credential. Conceptually speaking, a public-private key pair or key management material 
that is used within a blockchain wallet and a derived credential that is kept in some sort of a secure container, if you squint at it and look at it sideways, could be put in the same device itself. What we're looking for is innovative solutions sort of to align those two areas. If you are a, uh, a government employee or if you're a large organization that is using smart cards and X509 certificate as the authentication mechanism and you're using it from a mobile phone and you're also a using blockchain environments, is there a way to sort of, uh, sort of provide a common solution for storage, ideally in hardware, in how those key materials are done? So definitely interested in hearing what solutions are there in this. So let me touch on, um, again, lessons learned. This is important and this is critical and this is basically a deal breaker um, if you don't support this. So it is important for you to understand this. We're not, we're very concerned about being walked into a corner and told this is the only product that we will use. Interoperability for us is critical. Choice in the market is incredibly critical. So for us, APIs that you are exposing, that APIs that are facing the issuer, APIs that are facing the verifier, needs to be open, royalty-free, fully documented, and public. We are perfectly happy with you having your magic sauce behind the API. We want that magic sauce because that is your innovative technology that you bring to the table. But you will not use an API to lock us into a particular solution. Full stop, right? Publicly documented, open, royalty free, free to implement. Lessons learned regarding the specifications and things like that that we're championing on the improperly side. Start with the lowest piece of it, whether you have concerns about business models or the like, and I will stay away from that particular discussion. If you look at Google Knowledge Graph or uh, Facebook's Open uh, Graph API, they are some of the most scalable and interoperable infrastructures that are deployed right now. They are using linked data as a mechanism for making sure that, that, uh, that they are operating at scale. The standardization of that linked data is JSON LD, JSON linked data. That is a W3C standard, open, free to implement, free to use, royalty free. That is sort of a common data format that we are using, we have used in our interoperability pilots on the blockchain side, ensuring the ability to point from on-chain to off-chain. So we are looking at that as a data model to be applied for how you store content. Both verifiable credentials, excuse me, and decentralized identifiers are built on top of JSON LD. These are not specific, these are not standards. So the beauty of this piece here is that these are specifications. Specifications are something that all of you have the ability to influence. So you can now these specifications, as the sausage is being made, you can bring your voice to the table and influence it. Open, public, we will have a voice at the table, but our voice will be not governed. From our perspective, it is not going to be any louder than yours. We are not naive to the, um, perhaps, um, the, the modern version of the, the backroom deals that happen in uh, standards organizations. We are at the table because we are not fans of set backroom deals, and we want to make sure that uh, startup companies like yours are basically have the ability to have your voice heard and the ability to influence the standards um, going forward so that at the end of the process, what comes out as a standard is something that you all agree needs to be a standard and it has your use cases baked into that, right? And that is why we are we're going down this path at this stage because you have, the, it is open, it is public, even if you're not a member of these organizations, you actually can subscribe to the listserv and have full visibility into what decisions are being made one way or the other. 
and these organizations have different tiered structures. So if you actually want to participate, it is actually a reasonable cost even for very small organizations. So I'll give you a cost again. If, you, if you're a government entity and you want to participate, it is $2,000 for us to join W3C or something along those lines. It is smaller for other organizations. So this is not an outrageous amount of money. This is not keeping out uh, you know, uh, small organizations from having an influence on the specification of the standard. So this is critically important for us. Um, I'm not going to touch on every single one of them, but what I'm, what I'm noting here is these are the shells. These are the things that you must do within the solution from the perspective of we are big believers. I, I will simply note that I work for a sovereign, so I am not a big believer in the self-sovereign identity um, techno-utopian dream that, that is out there right now. However, we are big believers in people having direct ownership and control of the data and being accountable for their release and providing consent for releasing that information to any party. So from that perspective, the holder will have control over this data. They will also be accountable. You cannot have control and then basically not be accountable if you actually choose to perform an action that may not be in your best interest, but there will be accountability, but you will also be, have the ability to control that data as well. Solutions shall not have a dependency on any one single blockchain. I'll be interested to see how you guys will actually provide. Again, this goes back to the uh, thou shalt not walk us into a corner and tell us this is the only solution that you will use. Uh, you, we will not be locked into a particular solution. And our, our argument is we're not the only ones in this game. Everybody else who is an entity that has to interoperate with a wide segment of uh, business partners and others have the same need here as well. I mentioned this before. You will not reinvent the identity verification component. Please do not. We're not mandating a specific technology. What we are saying is that if you look at NIST 800-63, just the authenticator strength component piece of it, that document, forget about the identity proofing, forget about all of the other pieces. That particular document basically lays out what are the different types of authenticators, what is good, what is bad. For a classic cases in the latest version of NIST 800-63, they disavowed the use of SMS out of band as a second factor because it is susceptible to interception, right? So when you are talking about using an identity verification technology, at a minimum, it needs to meet authentication assurance level two or higher. What that technology is might be very unique to each of the organizations that you'll be working with, but that is the common specification that is accepted both by government and had input and acceptance by industries <coughs> when it came to identity verification. <laughs> uh, these are all the shoulds. You should do all of this. We hope that you do. Pay attention to them, right? So um, the third one is a near and dear to my heart. Um, we are DHS, we are the Department of Homeland Security. Um, whenever we talk about identity, uh, it gets conflated with um, surveillance and tracking. So I am explicitly noting here that one of the things that we are very concerned about the current environment, whether it is a federated environment or an aggregate provider environment, is that there is a dependency currently on identity, identity infrastructures in the issuer has often has visibility into where that credential is used. So if you're an attribute authority, and if you, if, even if you want to do a match no match against the attribute authority in order to understand where that credential is, you can triangulate them using GPS and things like that. We are very concerned about that. We, you know, if you're in the identity world, you understand the phone form problem. We are actually want something very similar to the standard type of uh, usage scenario where 
Um, this is a bad example, and I am being very clear that this is a bad example because a, a driver's license leaks PII like nobody's business, right? But if you're using a driver's license and you're trying to go into the park, let's just make sure that, that you, know, you, know, you understand that the DMV does not know that you've gone into a park, right? So the usage of these credentials should have a similar usage scenario where whoever is the issuer should not know that that credential has been used. That is the phone home problem that we want to mitigate. We do not want to track you. We have little desire, we got bigger problems. We have no issues and no desire to track you. We actually want to sort of solve the problems that these gentlemen talked about. So we, I would love to make sure that your solution bakes that, uh, um, your proposal bakes that particular solution into your solution set. Last but not least is, um, it's a should. So what we are looking for is, uh, my insights us here is that if you are trying to get an authority to operate on a government network, you have to go through this entire um, ATO process whereby you have to detail all the cryptographic algorithms and things like that that are being used and they have to meet all of these guidelines and things like that. It is a very, true reality right now, there's a whole set of crypto being used within the environment of the blockchain that NIST has not considered. Uh, they may not be um, on any, any, any FIPS approved list. What we want to understand is what are the crypto algorithms that are being used when it comes to uh, uh, the digital signatures, in your consensus algorithms, in your random number generation, because what we want to find out especially is that can they be swapped out for something if it exists that is NIST compliant? Because if you want to actually operationally deploy this technology, we do have to go through that process. And we want to know the information about what cryptographic algorithms that you support within that. Um, please, Melissa was very clear in noting that um, you articulate the milestones and the deliverables for each phase. That is very true. As a technical director, let me be much more clear uh, by noting that you're not throwing stuff at the wall hoping that we will catch it, <laughs> right? These, this is the objectives for phase one. This is what we would like to see accomplished in phase one. How you accomplish is something that you will propose to us. But we want to make sure that you have a, a this is not some, you know, something on a napkin. There is a real architecture and design that you, you have that we are going to evaluate and then you're going to agree to move forward on. We want to, first and foremost, with all of these people who are very involved in this, validate the security criteria that you need to meet from an equivalency perspective. You are now, digitally issuing credentials that were previously issued in paper. There is an equivalent or better uh, uh, security criteria that you need to meet. We will work with you to have and develop that and make sure that you are meeting them. Evaluate the design of the APIs. And again, uh, we're very clear that basically we want you to be successful in the marketplace we want you to keep your commercial marketplace and a roadmap. So we want to hear about how, by doing this, you will actually apply it to your product line and what your go-to-market strategy is. Because we do not want you to become dependent on government. We want you to be able to stand alone, not alone. We want you to be successful in the marketplace because then we can do what we do best. We buy. <laughs> Same objectives for phase two, phase three, and phase three. Read at your own leisure, uh, similar to that. One thing I will note is we are a trust but verify organization, which means by the time you get to phase three, expect to have a red team thrown at you, right? So um, by the time you get to phase three, you are feature complete, you have a clear idea. We will bring a red team to the mix you will not be able to skate 
by only on trust us, we know what we're doing. We will evaluate your technology. We will ensure the specifications and standards that you say that you're implementing, that you've demonstrated in wonderful demos to us are indeed the reality under the covers. And understand that we are, our red teaming tends to be uh, a two-phase process, typically. We actually are doing this to help you make your product stronger. We, want, we will do a testing basing based on public information regarding your product with your permission. But then if our red team discovers specific pieces where that it is of concern, they will work with you. They're not just interested in breaking the problem, uh, breaking your uh, product, they're interested in actually helping you fix that particular product to make it stronger. So we, and the wonderful thing, you don't have to pay for it, we will. So, but the, but the key point that I wanted, I wanted to take away is we will validate and verify your solution before we, we sort of stand behind it. And at this point in time, I'm going to invite uh, uh, the, the panelists from our components up to the table and so that we can basically uh, take uh, some questions from the audience that covers both the, the use cases as well as the, the any of the technical stuff that we we hide it. And if you if, if I could uh, request, um, you know, say your name and your organization affiliation as well before you ask the question. Please. Thank you. Um, wait for the mic because you know you're being you know screened globally. Johnny Crunch. So, uh, but uh, do I, with some of the quotes I've heard, do I really know who dot 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 acts on behalf of whom, and do they really have the authority to perform that action? Earlier in that uh, conversation, you really talked about not really wanting to be done at the end of the process. Take the process as being assume that that's actually going to happen. But as we've been talking about the rebooting web across the IW, the challenge of governance is still an issue. And so, like, it says who, who has the authority. That's where the tri tribal ID use case is, is just fascinating. Because it really is to, who has the, the, the authority at that tribal organization to, to dispense an identity card? And how do you verify the authenticity of that? So it really is a holistic viewpoint. And I'm just wondering, like, how, I know I'm just saying yes, what technological artifact and that can be validated. But as, as you heard me earlier, one of these paranoid uh, people who actually I really want to I'm, I'm really down in the details as far as like, you know, this hackability, vulnerability. So how do you find that balance of, of, of the ultimately name space registr registration of this is true because who said so? So we are defining the call to be very specific to a technical solution in order to find an alternative to current documents that are issued, whether it is tribal identity or physical documents. There is a current process that is used in the issuance of those paper documents. We are not touching that in any way, shape, or form. So a lot of the who has the authority is the entity who currently is issuing the paper document has the authority. Who says they do? They obviously have the current authority to do that, otherwise they would not be doing that. So, uh, our focus is very much on the technical aspects of this. Now, in order to operationally deploy it within a larger context, the points that you raised on who has the authority, who has the ability to deploy it and connect it to the systems will need to be resolved. That is why the people who sort of, in some cases, own the systems out of the table in, 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 the, in the case of USCIS. We obviously, do not own the tribal issuance 
uh, side of the house. Yeah, if I could add to that, because that's exactly right, that today we see track lightings at the right. GSA checkpoints. So we're already do, having to make decisions on how much to trust those lightings. What we're looking for from this technology is to be able to make a more informed decision. So we're not looking to regulate that issuance, but we're trying to understand how things were issued um, so that then we can build it into our decision making on uh, whether or not to accept. Now, then you get just sort of driven by the market in a lot of ways because it, it depends then on how important is it to a particular tribe that PSA accept that tribal document in uh, their checkpoint. Then it's a conversation of this is what we would need to see in terms of the information passed along for us to be able to make a, a yes decision. Now, if a tribe has no interest in a TS in having their cards accepted at a TSA checkpoint, then their governance is their governance. They, they're making those decisions. So going back to that, you know, the, the fundamental triangle of what we deal with here is that we have, you know, we have an issuing entity, we have the holder, and we have the uh, the verifier. So it's really a question of how important is it that that verifier accepts it, and that will determine how the issuer and how the holder will proceed. And, with, and to, to build off that and, and to kind of take it back to what you said earlier, in terms of this being, this whatever solution comes out of this could be applicable in a commercial setting to your company. Um, you know, USCIS is in a, a position for, for tribal identities that we would issue tribal identities for people that apply for a benefit from our agency. And if we're able to make it work, and verified by TSA, then there's a catalyst for a tribe to implement that technology, you know, on their own. But but we have no authority to, to direct a tribe to 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 use this solution. Fundamentally speaking, um, and we'll um, we'll take another question. The the key point is we are very concerned about the current reliance on paper as the the. For, for these type of documents, which we, there's some really good stuff that, that's out there uh, that, that's fighting in how good it is. So having said that, who is, okay, back there. My question though is on how much coordination is being done with other government agencies in terms of these technologies. Uh, if a company is already working with the, the Department of State or the Department of Defense that has the technology that they're using there, uh, how open is DHS to uh, essentially sharing that technology with another agency? So we're always interested in what our counterparts in government are doing. And if you believe that the technology that you are working on with them is something that we would have interest in um, seeing, and if it is meeting the the, the criteria that we are uh, focused on regarding choice, interoperability, and diversity, obviously um, um, happy to happy to entertain the the the, uh, the, the, uh, the the proposal. We also have regular conversations with our counterparts within government in sharing best practices and things of that nature, so. So just so I want to make sure we understand that uh, the U.S. is still engaging with that issue of technology. It's still going to be fully developed. We have to see what the wins are and see what they are going to be after. Okay, and Austin Altman, uh, Radiant. We do biometric and lock factor authentication platform. And my question here, I'm just curious about the prevents that, uh, the scenario where you talk about identity of organization and database. Because for me, we are working biometrics to understand individuals, to understand how we verify individuals that, and so on. But when you talk about organization, what do you think, where is the issuer? Who is the holder? Who will verify? And if an organization, yeah, it's a little bit, can you give us like some hints about this kind of scenario? Who would be the issuer for the, and within the organization? Who would be, is it like multi-party, like things like that? That would be really good, thank you. Yeah, you kind of took away the magic wand. Um, 
what it comes down to, and I think uh, what I think it's going to come down to is uh, if there are known entities that they are dealing with that we that we know, right, as being viable entities, will they vouch for the entity coming on board? Could be uh, banks, it could be credit card companies, it could be um, potentially other importers, it could be uh, brokerage communities. All of those communities that, that currently exist uh, could be potentially good to validate that uh, this is a, a legitimate business. But so then the business. So if, if I may add a couple of things. Yes, so by the way, we are asking you for solutions, this is an opportunity to bring your creativity and your knowledge of the environment in, in solving this. A one piece of information that I will give you to, to, to go to take a look at is um, gsasam.gov currently has a open RFI on what they call entity validation that defines their criteria of what they want to see in establishing the identity of an organization that wants to do business with the government. That might be a good starting point to sort of get a view into what GSA considers uh, is a set of data points that they're looking for in order to validate the identity of it. Does that mean is it, it's going to be the same for somebody from Office of Trade? No, but what we are looking for is is, is solutions that sort of bring multiple signals that allow us to make a risk-based decision on the identity of an organization. Um, there are organizations, for example, the province of British Columbia uh, recently put forth a, they're coming out with their, uh, the, the provincial registrar to stand behind an attestation of somebody within the organization that may or may not exist within the US. We are looking for solutions, we're looking for ideas. Help us, help the broader community. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Sergey Crawford for the Egress Corporation. We're a conceptual design, blockchain conceptual design company. Two questions. Um, I want to a little bit more information about the green card, smart card that you're developing. And um, then my other question is, when you're saying you don't want personal sensitive information stored on the blockchain, what are you considering personal and sensitive information? Um, so what, what specific information um, on the, the green card are you looking for? So are you programming the smart card so it can, can create interoperability at this point? No, so the, the green card itself is a, is a standalone document. It has a it has an RFID um, antenna in it, but all that is is providing a ID tag. So when someone presents that card at a port of entry, the border patrol reader energizes that antenna. It provides a unique a unique ID that's pre-programmed into the um, the card itself or the antenna. And it, all that is, is is initiating a search within the CBP system to pull up that identity. Um, so that, so we're not putting data onto the green card. Um, so the identity is it could be the name. Too. The identity is is the identity that's in the system that we that we've given to CBP um, through through backend systems. So, so I, I think the way that you phrase the question makes an assumption that we are digitally issuing a green card at this point in time. No, we're looking for solutions on how to digitally issue green cards right that now. That is why the call exists as it exists okay. right now. As to what data is considered PII, as somebody who is, uh, who was an immigrant and is now a naturalized citizen, I would say that there is a significant amount of uh, personal information like uh, so with, you know, if, if any 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 set of biographic information to include a unique number like an alien number a receipt number social security number that combined would be considered PII or sensitive PII name date of birth biometric measurements height things right. like that so it's anything that could be used to personally identify 
individual. And I think it is important to separate and 100% agree that it's a separate thing than the blockchain, but you know, a digital driver's license, it's gonna have PII right. as part of the digital driver's license. That's the value. That's not what we're looking for in the blockchain. We're but looking for that for the digital blockchain. <laughs> So it, it is important to note that if you look at the diagram that we talked about, there is the holder of the credential who has control over their data. That credential will contain privacy information that is under their control that they can choose to release or not release. But what will be put on the blockchain is not that data. It is the proof of that data that it is legitimate, its provenance, and the like. You will not put private data sensitive data, any type of data that people would even have an inkling that they, uh, that they consider uh, some sort of a, uh, a privacy sensitive type of data on the blockchain at all. So how do you architect a solution? How do you come up with a solution that gives us all of the security benefits and none of the privacy, uh, uh, pri and addresses the privacy concerns that everybody rightfully have about their data? There's a lot of government provided what constitutes PII. PII. You can look on any number of DHS uh, privacy impact assessments, which we do in all programs that will discuss what's considered PII, which are the privacy groups that set out uh, a lot of guidelines on what's PII. Uh, but it's a, it's a pretty broad topic. And if you're dealing in the cargo space, remember trade secrets, right? Because what are the people doing right now? Well, maybe not so much right now, but they'll go into the garbage belt to pull out documents to figure out what's going on with that corporation, how much information can they get off of it. We spent three hours just on discussing with NASA CASA whether or not we can tell the, the general public on the blockchain how many times a shipment came out of Mexico or, or um, Canada. Okay, that's how important it is to us. Hi, my name is Patrick Hendrick. I'm uh, with Mavenet, uh, which is a blockchain uh, uh, native. My question is, uh, which is related to your you know, uh, inspiration of uh, research paper here, you, you talked before about the importance of uh, decoder legacy. Now, when you when we decode, we try to make sure that we use the same standards, right? But there's a different way when we move backwards uh, in this type of decoder. So, uh, in terms of process, like how can we find out, how do we get close to existing technology so that we are able to May I take that one first? So um, that is an interesting way of phrasing a very tough question, <laughs> which is how do we you, uh, basically give you access to our current APIs so that you can build to it? We're not going to do that, right? <laughs> what we're asking you to do is define a clean, interoperable API that is publicly documented. There is going to be some translation that we will have to do in order to make it work but by providing our API, our concern is that now, you are now building a government-specific API instead of the open set of APIs that is widely usable. So from that perspective, the expectation is that you will build an open, interoperable, license-free, patent-free, free to develop by anybody and use API, which is going to front your wonderfully magic system that is sitting behind it. And we will sort of work with you in order to integrate with that from our side. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yes, sir. Hopefully, that was great. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, uh, gentlemen, first of all, thank you. This has been an amazing presentation. Like, really impressive, and thought, and everything that's been going into this, so thank you for that. My name is Jonathan Brown, I'm one of the founders of Smart Axiom. We're essentially a cybersecurity company for the internet of things. So we've worked out how to solve a lot of the key challenges around this here. Looking first of all at commissioning, decommissioning, recommissioning devices. And secondly, looking at reducing keys and certificates within the system and changing the hashing mechanism. Thirdly, it's a low latency blockchain that's actually embedded on the devices. So it's actually directly into the devices and we manage to get them on the sensors as well. So we're currently working with some major semiconductor companies that are going to embed and embed technology right onto their devices. 
And we're also working with a number of supply chain companies looking at, at bringing all this together into a large spectrum. I'm here with Jonathan Daniel. So there is a question that is phrased <laughs> as a statement. It is, it is. And Jonathan Daniel here is the cargo clearance. We're very looking at increased uh, cargo clearance. So part of the reason why I'm trying to line that up is as you look at these devices interconnecting around the world, is there an openness to actually embedding the blockchain whilst fulfilling each of the specific requirements that you've talked about, so you're not basically uh, putting certain public information on the blockchain, but you're actually using it as an application and, and, and processing uh, solution for the actual sort of coming in and out of frontier and everyone else as well. So I, I'm not 100% clear on what you're asking. I may not be technical enough to yeah. understand, but I will tell you that in the future vision I've been saying that blockchain is the perfect partner to IoT, right? Because from our vantage point, um, why wouldn't a company and the government want to know exactly when something comes off the line, as it's passing through certain points, even down to the um, bicycle rider down in uh, Thailand or something like that, and when it comes in, getting to the consumer, okay, ultimately. One of the proof of concepts that we have coming up right now is on um, um, intellectual property rights. And that, that concept of legitimacy gets to the point where we're even gonna test out at some point, can we get the consumer onto the blockchain to authenticate a product? Not that the government would authenticate it, but the actual rights holder company, which begins to mix into what you're stating. Now, what I don't understand is when you, and you know, is when you say embed the block the blockchain onto the are you talking about a small piece of code or what is it that you yeah. Yeah. So, so hold that thought right so, so I'll simply know that you bring up a very interesting and challenging problem within this environment where the physical to digital binding uh, becomes very critical and it is not a blockchain problem it is actually um, if you are not actually have a secure process for uh, uh, binding the physical good to the electronic representation of the good that is stored on the blockchain. And if you lose that synchronization, you end up with a you know, tracking immutable chain of garbage. So, so <laughs> we understand that, and we are looking for solutions in that particular area. Having said that, we, uh, th there is one question online, and I think that will be our last question at this point in time, because uh, we all love to talk, and we've been talking about it. So the question, Yes. Okay. The question from online is, are the slides available? They will be available. Uh, please actually email us at dhs.philiton-valley at hq.dhs.gov. We will be sending out a closing email, and it will contain information on how to find the slides. And beyond that, uh, if you already found the fbo.gov website uh, where this call is posted, we will be posting the slides there as well. And if you are really in a hurry, <laughs> it, pardon? Uh, yeah, it, it, it moves at the pace of government. Yeah. So having said that, thank you all very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Doug, go ahead. Uh, several people still have questions, so to she be, will be here standing yes. with the questions answered. Don't go away without your questions getting answered. Yeah, we are here, we are happy to answer your questions. Please stay. And by this point in time, we are going to transition to a very important gentleman, uh, to a very important uh, uh, part of our presentation that you are all familiar and I'm sure wanted to hear, which is our uh, IT side. And Cheryl, it is your own. about how the agreement works and what it is that we do and do not want uh, from you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so as we've been talking about, you know, for throughout the, the uh, meeting here, is we are looking for small businesses, for innovative companies to help us solve these challenges. Um, we're looking for lowering the barrier of entry. 
Uh, we want to match Homeland Security technologies with a DHS government or customer. We want to, we want to help um, small businesses to push their technologies and create a bigger market for us. So everybody kind of wins. Um, we don't want the core IT. This isn't a big government vacuum to try to get you know, whatever's out there. We want to be your customer. Um, don't want your proprietary information. That's yours, it's proprietary. Um, if it comes to us, it becomes public domain. You know, it's the, the sausage, and, and so we don't want that. We, we want you to thrive. We want your, your business to, to, to grow. So we don't want to impede you in any way. Um, there's three pieces of the agreement that come, there's, uh, regarding the information that we're going to be uh, talking about. The confidentiality of the information, the IP, and um, information regarding if, if you're business um, is sold or if your business line gets, gets sold. Um, so the exchange and handling of confidential information, kind of important for the government because we have the Freedom of Information Act. So we want to be really, really careful when you're giving us information that you, you tell us that it's your proprietary information. It must be marked. We must be able to see it because that is the thing that um, tells us that we can't give it out when the public asks for it. So be careful about the information that you give us. And if it is proprietary, mark it and make sure that we know that it is, it is confidential. Um, we agree to use reasonable efforts to protect it, you know, as, as per the law. Um, the obligation remains for as long as that information is proprietary, not to the end of the agreement, but as long as the information is proprietary. Um, I've said we don't want to, we, we, we don't want to, we want, we want it to be protected. We want you to grow as a business. Um, you know, you may, you may even develop new IP, you may develop new trade secrets. You know, Mazda Talk, great. We're, we're glad we want you to do well. Um, and we don't, we don't want ownership of that. We, we don't want royalties. We don't want a piece of it. Um, as far as what you're bringing to the table, we have a section in the agreement that just asks for sort of a, a thumbnail sketch of what technology belongs to you, what technology does not belong to you that you might be using, and the piece of it that you might be working on for the problem set for, for you know, where does that fit in? So it's a, just, a, just a real thumbnail sketch of what it is that you intend to, to um, show us. Um, as, as stated, mark the data. Uh, we do have an IP license in the agreement and uh, when you submit the deliverables that you're going to submit to the government, it's usually just going to be a report. And we do actually want the ability to use the shared report. Some businesses get a little squeamish about that. And there are cases of a number of times we've agreed to sort of a, a, a government-only report and there may be a publicly available report so that we can you know, we, we have something we can share, but something we can still use internally. Um, we also ask for um, assistance, maybe you know, up to three years after, in case something comes up because the technology is moving, we may have questions, we just want to come back to you and ask questions, that's it. Um, we also may have a situation, and Neil touched on it a little bit, where we might be doing some testing so we ask for some, some rights as far as our ability to test and to sort of get our, our fingers into it a little bit. But that's only within the context of the state of the work, and that's only within the context of the period of performance. So again, we're not trying to take anything, walk away, and, and reproduce it later, take it down to a secret lab, and you know, do our, build our own. We want to be a commercial customer. That is the point. 
Um, please keep in mind when we talk about deliverables, that is not the same thing as, as a project plan. Like for deliverables, that means what are you going to hand over to the government? And again, for this type of transaction, we are generally looking for reports. We're not looking for stuff. So uh, do not give us anything that we didn't ask for. Don't give us your proprietary information. Don't overshare if you don't have to. Uh, work with us, we will work with you. Um, but just keep in mind, um, don't overshare. Um, one thing that we do worry about is you know, in, in the event that your business is acquired and we're in the middle of our agreement, you do need to let us know who is going to be acquiring you because we have to double check as to whether we're allowed to work with that company. If we're not allowed to work with the company, then you know, we cannot continue with the agreement with the new company. So um, that's one kind of important piece of this. Um, we try, we, we would like a 60 days notice, that's not always <coughs> possible, but at some point we are going to need to know who it is and we are going to have to do our due, due diligence. Um, I think that's it. And so I'll be around for questions. I, I can take your question now. So I suppose just uh, the copyright and drive uh, copyright for intellectual property. So um, the question is about derived copyright. So if there's an open source project that is delivered, but then the business plan goes down the route of uh, leveraging libraries in more proprietary implementations of that use case, uh, it just reminds me of the big issue with Google and uh, Oracle with buying Java libraries. Uh, so where's the line as far as like, yes, we want, ideally want this open source and build an ecosystem around standards, but then we also have to sort of have a business plan that actually grows the company. And so is, is, is the derived copyright also included? As far as what you're delivering to the government? Because we basically what, what the other transactions are doing, what this program is for is to understand what it is that your company is doing, how are you doing that, and the purpose of that is for us to start to plan on how we're going to acquire that. What do we have to do on the back end to position ourselves to purchase if, if in fact that's what we're going to do? So it's not really about delivering us something, it's more about us gathering knowledge and understanding of what it is that you're doing and you're performing. So that source code needs to be deliverable? We're not necessarily asking for source code. Um, there, there could be a situation where we might be testing something, in which case we, would, we may have like a limited license for that purpose, but it would be very limited. We're not trying to take anything away from you that you own. Uh, we can take uh, maybe one more question, either on the IP or the programmatic stuff. Otherwise, we'll be here for office hours, so I can jump into the uh, the end piece. So I just have one question. My name is Marquise Cabrera. I'm the head of our global government garage out here. Um, so I built a ton of blockchains globally. And, but my question is, um, I sold as an entrepreneur before this, and having worked at the White House under President Obama, um, we have seen this problem over and over again, where you ask startups to join government and these kinds of efforts. And then, then they don't end up being sustained, right? Because there's no market, or for lack of a better word, there's no business model. Uh, and so, and I, we've seen this at the White House where we had the Data Driven Justice Project that came out of it. And so the awesome part about this is you guys are actually creating the actual funding stream. And so we have a $9 billion portfolio where we're trying to figure out how do we get startups onto our contract vehicles, right? And so uh, is it, if I'm an entrepreneur and I go back into the entrepreneurship space, I don't see a market. Like, unless you're asking me to, if I'm an entrepreneur who has a company, I see a fungible product, right? It's like, can your product be fungible? Um, but if I'm building a custom-made product, unless I see a market, I'm just not sure how I would go after it. So can you talk about how you're working with, and I was at the Army Futures Camp at Brooks, and they were saying that they don't see startups coming onto their, uh, working with them directly, they wanna use 
the bigs to help the smalls. And so I just want to know what, what is your strategy for figuring out how to leverage the bigs to actually create the market for the smalls? Um, so that's actually a good, uh, thanks for that question. Um, so so I'll, I'll answer it in kind of like two parts, right? So the program is designed that um, what we're asking startups to develop shouldn't divert them off of what they're already commercially developing, right? So there, there should exist a commercial market for them already with us being an, an additional customer under that market. Um, as far as um, leveraging the bigs, um, that is totally the choice of the startup, how they want to, um, how they want to sell to the government uh, in the end. And in, in some cases, it may make sense for a startup to partner with a big, um, depending on the type of enterprise solution or whatever that might be. But in some cases, we've seen our startups licensing directly the software to, um, to the, the tech shop. Um, in some cases, we've seen the startup choose. They don't want to sell directly, and so they're working with an integrator. Um, and, and in some cases, that, that's, that's part of it, right? They've got a radar technology. They're not going to build the major system that the radar technology is going to go into. Um, they want to stay nimble. They want to stay specific to their core. That's how they want to do it. In other cases, they want to start building a business, so they have started actually going down the process of getting accredited, getting their books accredited. They want to actually be the one to sell a product to that uh, our agency, as well as have been solicited by other government agencies as a, as a, as a result of the relationship they have with us. So it kind of really depends on the startup um, and and uh, and really the the project and the the end mission that that um, solution is going into. And it could also depend on the technology and the, and the deployment opportunities. Some some startups will never be able to manage the, the scale of what has to be built, and so they're going to have to partner. But every technology is going to be a little bit different. So as we're having these sort of like phased um, relationships with the companies we're asking these hard questions, right? If a company decides that they want to go into sort of selling direct, we're asking the hard questions of what's your scale? What's your ability to scale? What's your marketing plan? What's your manufacturing plan? Are you working with your VC? You know, how are you going to be developing this as a commercial product that also sells, sells to us too? you'll find that there's actually some bigs in the room here. So you guys, in, the, in the networking mingling part, you guys may actually want to start talking to each other too. Um, just and and I'll just add a point that we've had a lot of complaints from the bigs. You know, why is EHS um, spending money on startups? Why aren't you spending money on the bigs? <laughs> and what we've just told them is, look, innovation is in the startup company. If you want to know where your funding, everything is open and transparent. We post press releases and everything. You're the big. If you want to know where we're funding, Go start making that relationship with the startup company right now, because in some cases we do need the bigs to actually deliver. So I'd also add, because I'm not sure if I actually agree with your thesis that you need the bigs in order to get into the government, right? So I'm not saying that you do. So, 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 but the point, so yeah. the point is basically one of the things that we've set up as part of the OTA is the ability that if you graduated from the OTA, uh, the, the four phases of the critical design program, there is an opportunity for an operational component to actually make a direct buy from the startup under a certain pressure. That is something that, for example, our Customs and Border Protection is now uh, in the process of uh, putting into place. That is something that we have, because you're absolutely right, there needs to be a pathway for full acquisition at the end of the development cycle, and we're putting that into place. Okay, so we're pretty much at the end of our um, time. We're gonna have office hours, but I wanted to just jump in real quick. Real quick. Uh, basically, if you're interested, um, eligibility, right? So are you eligible to apply to our program? Here are the requirements. You have a DUNS number, you have uh, your, your company with less than 200 employees, um, and you have not been a part of uh, a contract totaling over a million dollars within the last 12 months either as a prime or as a sub. 
Um, so these are our requirements, oh, and you have not had a cost accounting contract with the, the US government uh, in the past 12 months. Um, these are our requirements for the program. Um, this is because we're using something called the Other Transaction Authority uh, for us to um, work with uh, startups and entrepreneurs. So this is important. Determine whether you're eligible. If you have any questions, feel free to send us an email. Um, and uh, as, uh, as we walk through kind of the, pro the, the topic, uh, first determine your eligibility, look at the call, make sure that this is a product um, and a solution that you can adapt to, um, uh, or that your solution can adapt to our use cases, as you've heard. Um, and if you have any questions about the application process, uh, feel free to send us an email. Um, uh, thanks for Anil for talking about those specific milestones and for Cheryl to talk about deliverables. Uh, those are important as you note them in the application. So for example, a demo could be a milestone, but what you're delivering us is a report of the demo that was completed. Um, so that those are some things to be thinking about. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to email us, uh, but uh, we're really looking forward to your application. Thanks for your time and uh, appreciate your interest. I do want to highlight number three. If you're um, not registered in something called SAM.gov, you need to look at that. It's, it's not an easy process, but if you're selected, that's how we pay you. You have to have an account in SAM.gov. So you might want to look at that as well. Yep, SAM.gov is important. It takes time. <laughs> Thank you.